I hope you'll turn with me in a Bible to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. And today we'll be focusing on verses 13 to 23. There is no denying the fact that this season, this COVID-19 season, has been enormously disruptive for the work of the church, capital C, and for lowercase c, churches like ours. It has been incredibly disruptive. And we can see just how disruptive it is when we consider the fact that even before the pandemic, fewer and fewer people were going to church especially in the younger demographic. Church was becoming a pastime, maybe something for Easter, something for Christmas, but something that the majority of people don't really need on a weekly basis. That was already happening. That trend was already well underway before a pandemic hit. And now... Just consider how disruptive it is when we can't all gather safely. There is no telling what will be left when we can all regather safely. And I don't know exactly why God is allowing that or what God's doing, but I do know that God's Word tells us over and over again that we should expect the genuineness of our faith and the genuineness of the church's confession of Jesus as Lord to be tested. And so when we stand back for just a moment, instead of getting enmeshed in the turmoil of daily headlines, we can see we really shouldn't be surprised by this. This is exactly the kind of thing that Jesus tried to prepare his church for. You will be tested. In this world, you will have trouble. It's not really that shocking. It's not really that surprising. We need to be aware that our faith and the genuineness of our faith will be tested. That's not in question. What is in question is whether or not you and I will pass the test whether or not our faith and our commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ is genuine or not. While the writer Thomas Paine, who inspired so much of the American Revolution, was not a Christian, his words do apply to our current circumstances. When the American Revolution was at a low ebb and it appeared as though there were was no more revolution. It appeared as though George Washington and the Continental Army were on their last leg. He wrote a pamphlet that George Washington had read to his army. And those famous lines begin with this. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier... And the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink away. But the one who stands firm deserves commendation. And so, I think the principle applies now. These are the times that try the Lord's church and try the Lord's people. And the question for you and for me is, are you a Sunday disciple of Jesus? Or are you a saved sinner? That's the test. So measure yourself against what we read here. And remember the truth that the, the Sunday disciple of Jesus will shrink from Jesus when trials come. The Sunday disciple, if 
If all your faith is is showing up once a week to sit in a pew and hear a sermon or sing songs, well, if that's all it is, you will shrink from Jesus. An online church won't cut it. But the saved sinner will stand by their Savior come what may. The saved sinner, saved by the amazing grace of God, will stand by their Savior come what may, which are you. And we have this beautiful example of what it looks like to be faithful and loyal to God's King in a biblical character that most of us have probably never even heard of. His name is Itai. Watch for him as we read these verses, beginning at verse 13. A messenger came and told David, The hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. The king's officials answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. The king set out, with his entire household following him. But he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out, with all the people following him. And they halted at the edge of the city. All his men marched past him, along with all the Carathites and Pelathites, and all the 600 Gittites who had accompanied him from Gath, marched before the king. The king said to Ittai, the Gittite, Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom. You are a foreigner an exile from your homeland. You came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I am going? Go back and take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. But Ittai replied to the king, as surely as the Lord lives, and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. David said to Ittai, go ahead, march on. So Ittai the Gittite marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. The whole countryside wept aloud as all the people passed by. The king also crossed the Kidron Valley, and all the people moved on toward the wilderness. So David is told, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. As we saw last week, Absalom has managed to seduce all the people into believing, or at least the majority of people, into believing that he would make a better king than his father, David. And he has all the makings of a great politician. He woos the people. They see him as beautiful, and they think that he would be more competent than David. And their hearts are stolen by Absalom over the course of four years. Well, eventually, Absalom proclaims himself king. He just comes out and says it. Open insurrection and rebellion. Now he's the king, and the vast majority of people follow him. And we're told that the conspiracy gained strength, and his following kept on increasing. And so finally, word gets to David, and it's like the old David is back. Whatever spiritual slumber David may have been in, he finally wakes up and starts to take decisive action. He says, we've got to get out of here. We have to leave the capital city. We have to leave Jerusalem. Everybody, let's go. And the servants who remain, those who remain loyal to him, set out, and they moved eastward to the wilderness across the Kidron Valley. 
And we have to take a moment to appreciate this scene. This is not how we typically picture King David, right? This is God's chosen king. And while, yes, he committed egregious sin with Bathsheba and then had her husband killed, this is God's king. This is the one God has put on this throne. The people chose a king, Saul. He turned out to be an abysmal failure, but David is the people's king. This is the, he is God's king. This is the one that God has put here. And he's brought him to Jerusalem. He's given him this throne. And now he's heading into exile. What's happening? This is a shocking scene. And it raises the question for you and for me. Can you stand by your Savior despite opposition? Can you stand despite opposition? Because on Sundays, while every church has its differences in in its midst, we generally agree that Jesus is the hero, right? You can, you can generally assume that, at least in theory, at least in name. It's about Jesus. We're called Christians. This is a church. We have pictures of Jesus all around us. But the real test of our faith is not what happens on Sunday, what we do on Sunday, but how we live Monday to Saturday. Right? When we're not surrounded by people who think Jesus is the hero. When we're not surrounded by people who agree with us or who have any commitment to God's truth whatsoever. That's when you will be tested. And the genuineness of your faith will be tested. Can you stand firm then? Or are you merely a Sunday disciple? This is the true test of who is loyal to God's king and who is not. And it's exactly what the Lord Jesus prepared us for. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 34, we read this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and Follow me, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Whoever stands firm now in the midst of this sinful and adulterous generation, that's the true disciple. That's the one who not only says Jesus is Lord, but who is willing to take up their cross and follow him. No matter how much opposition there is, Only a saved sinner has that kind of fortitude and commitment to the Lord. So be aware. God's cause, God's truth, God's church, God's people will face opposition. That's inevitable. And will you be ashamed of him or not? Will you shrink back from Jesus when everyone else in the room is against him? Or maybe if they're not explicitly against him, they want to minimize who he is and not confess his full lordship. I'll never forget the day I was sitting in a college anthropology class. 
And the professor asked for a show of hands. He said, how many of you in here believe that there's such a thing as absolute truth? How many? Raise your hand. And only a handful went up. And mine was not among them. For two reasons. First, I was too scared to openly confess in that classroom. But also because I wasn't really sure in that season of my life whether or not I believed there was such a thing as absolute truth. And the professor's response was, well, for those who raise their hand, thank you for your honesty. I know there are probably more in this room. And he said, you know, it's, it's really true. This is something we have to acknowledge, that there are people in this world who believe in absolute truth. And it was kind of like, it's not like a unicorn. There are people that believe this, believe it or not. As crazy as that seems, that there is anybody that would actually believe there's such a thing as absolute truth. Well, there are people like that. We need to, we need to understand that that's how the world is. And it was very dismissive and condescending, right? Who could believe that? And my hand didn't go up. But I think about that vividly when I consider Jesus' words, whoever is ashamed of me in this sinful and adulterous generation, whoever is ashamed of me, is that you? Is that me? When we're the only ones in the room, when we're in the minority, when we're the only ones still going to church, when we don't even have a a building to meet in, Will you still come? Or will you shrink back from your Savior? That's the test. Can you pass the test with flying colors or not? Let's look to someone who did pass the test with flying colors. Ittai. We're told that as the king set out, he initiates kind of a grand review. He goes to the very outskirts of the city and pauses to see who will march by. And among those who do march by, who go with him, are the Carathites and Pelathites and 600 Gittites. You don't need to know exactly where all those people are from, but you need to know that this is kind of like the foreign legion in Israel. These are all people who are foreigners to Israel. This is not their homeland. And who are the Gittites? The Gittites, like Ittai, are from Gath. Who else is from Gath? The giant Goliath was from Gath. In other words, these are Philistines. These are Israel's arch enemies, and yet at least 600 of them have cast their lot with David. All going back to a time in 1 Samuel when David was on the run from King Saul and he found refuge among the Philistines, and some evidently stayed with him. That's who Atai is. He's a Philistine. So, Just consider everything that he's leaving behind to follow David. The personal loss. And it raises the question for you and for me. Can you stand beside the Lord Jesus Christ despite personal loss? What are you willing to bear up with in the face of opposition, to stand by God's king. Well, David recognized what Ittai was giving up and actually tries to persuade him to stay in Jerusalem. Look at David's reasoning in verse 19. Why should you come along with us? Go back and stay with King Absalom, the king. And this is Striking in of itself that he refers to Absalom as the king. It's not that David is 
acknowledging the legitimacy of Absalom as king, but he is acknowledging political reality. And the political reality on the ground is that Absalom is about to be on the throne of Israel. He has the majority. He has the power. He has the influence at this point. And David is telling Atai, I don't know exactly where I'm going. I'm headed to the wilderness. I don't know if I'm ever coming back. So why would you throw your lot with me? Stay in Jerusalem. You'll be safer that way. You are a foreigner in exile from your homeland. This isn't even your fight, Itai. This isn't even your kingdom. Do what's best for you, number one. He says, you came only yesterday, and today shall I make you wonder? And probably this doesn't mean literally yesterday, within the last 24 hours. Probably this means within a recent amount of time. You're new to this. Don't throw your life away. See how David's trying to persuade him not to come. He doesn't use manipulation. He doesn't use coercion. He doesn't use force. He leaves it up to a tie. And he says it would really be better for you personally, better for your health, better for your safety, better for your comfort if you stayed in Jerusalem. The options are clear. Absalom equals comfort, peace, safety. David equals danger, uncertainty, wilderness. Which do you pick? And the same choice is here for you and for me. Do you choose Absalom? Or do you choose David? David says, Go back, take your people with you. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. He gives him God's blessing. No hard feelings, Atai. Jesus offered similar counsel in Luke chapter 14 when he tells us to count the cost of following him. In Luke 14, verse 25, we read, Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Count the cost, Jesus says. Don't just throw your lot with me because that's what most people are doing. Don't just throw your lot in with me because your parents did, or because you've gone to church your whole life, or because you don't know where else you would turn without the Christian faith. Count the cost. To follow Jesus is to invite personal loss. It will cost you. It may cost you family relationships. It may cost you your own people, your own party, your friends, your co-workers. Itai left all that behind. He took the risk. He didn't know whether the other Gittites were going to follow him or not. He knew He was committed to David, come what may. And also notice how publicly he does this. Everyone sees his decision. And what you and I need to remember is that you cannot sneak your way into heaven. You cannot go elope with Jesus, so to speak. If you are with Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you cast your lot and your life with Jesus, you must do so publicly. You cannot be ashamed of him. No matter who goes with you 
and who doesn't. That's why we don't do private baptisms here. We don't do secret baptisms. We, we do baptisms front and center. Do you love Jesus or not? Are you willing to tell the world you love Jesus or not? No matter what that costs you. And there was a day and time in this country when there was social and political capital to be gained by being an upstanding member of such and such church on a corner. And if you're a deacon there, oh, this is really a fine citizen. Those days are over. Nowadays, even in the Bible Belt, it's becoming increasingly likely that you're going to be accused of being behind the times, out of date, out of step with the culture, with mainstream thinking, if you try to maintain the truth of God's Word and the morality of God's Word, it will cost you. Are you ready? Or are you a Sunday disciple? If everybody else is there, I'll be there, but I won't be the only one. Count the costs. Think carefully. And then look at Itai's response. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, and as my Lord the King lives, wherever my Lord the King may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. So ask yourself this question. Can you stand despite uncertainty? Can you stand despite uncertainty? Despite not knowing what that full cost may be? Despite not knowing exactly where Jesus may lead you. He's heading out into the great unknown, to the wilderness. All the countryside is weeping aloud as they see him going. Are you going to go with him? Or are you going to stay in Jerusalem where people are celebrating and happy? Whether it means life or death. At this point... To stay with David means you're not staying with David because of his position, because of his wealth, because of his prosperity, because of his power. All that's gone, long gone. The only reason to stay with David, God's king at this point, is because of David and his person and his calling. And it may be that in your life, there will be seasons when you don't have anything but uncertainty and Jesus, your Savior. And this is where the real test comes. Is Jesus merely a role model? Is he merely your inspiration? Is he merely a figure on a stained glass window? Is he merely a character in a book? Or is he your living and risen Lord who demands and has the right to demand ultimate allegiance from you? Sunday disciples will shrink when that kind of trial comes. But a saved sinner will stand by him. Come what may? Which are you? Which am I? This is the question. Wherever my Lord the King may be, and where is Jesus? Well, to be sure, he's not limited to church, is he? Jesus is alive and well in the world, at work in the world, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Will you follow wherever the Holy Spirit leads you? outside the walls of a building, into your home, into your community, or not? Or 
when you leave Jesus in a church, it's a lot safer that way, let me tell you. It's a lot safer not to take the name of Jesus out there. Now, some of you may be ready to say, okay, okay, I get it, I get it. I, I, I don't want to be a Sunday disciple. I get it, Dane. I want to be a saved sinner. Okay, okay, I get it. Be careful. Because someone who was totally assured that he would follow Jesus no matter what, the Apostle Peter denied him three times, left Jesus all alone. When Jesus told him, you're going to do that, Peter said, oh no, even if everyone else abandons you, Lord, I won't. Even if I have to die for you, Lord, I'll do it. I will never abandon you. And yet he did. And so what you and I have to remember is that we don't get to take any credit for our loyalty. If you're relying on your own willpower, your own words, your own understanding, well, you're going to stumble and fall every single time. No matter how much you confess, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. I will never abandon you. If that's just Dane Hadley saying that, (laughs) I'll abandon him. I'll be ashamed. I won't raise my hand. What you need and what I need is for the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, to fill you so that you move at the impulse of His love. That's what you need. That's what I need. We can't do it. But by His power working in us and through us, We can, all because He enables us. We don't get to take any credit for this. We can't go with Jesus all the way to Calvary. We need what Jesus did for us. That's what makes it grace. We can't take any credit for for it. We need His blood to be shed in our place for His holy, righteous life to be offered in our place for His resurrected life and the power of His life to fill us and move us. And it is only in Him and because of Him and through Him that we can stand firm. And we only have that power if we can confess joyfully and willingly without any manipulation or coercion, I am a sinner and my only hope of salvation is the amazing grace of God. Can you say that today? I pray that you would by the power of the Holy Spirit working in you so that we could stand in his presence joyfully so that we would be empowered to be his presence in this world come what may. May God protect you, protect me from being merely a Sunday disciple. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this example of Ittai. What a hidden gem he is in your word. In the midst of so much loss and hopelessness, When everyone else was weeping and crying, he stood firm by your chosen king. May we learn from him. May we confess, Lord, that we have no right to stand with your king, whether he's in exile or whether he's sitting on his throne. Our only hope is your grace. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you that we have your grace available to us because of Jesus. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in each and every one of our hearts to either confess Jesus as Lord for the very first time so that we would stand firm, so that it wouldn't just be a one-time commitment 
It wouldn't just be one event, that it would be a lifelong commitment to Jesus. Or, Lord, where we may be backsliding, where we may be giving more attention to what we do on Sunday than to what we do Monday to Saturday. Lord, call us home. Call us back to our first love. The Lord Jesus Christ Himself in all of His righteousness and gentleness and mercy for sinners. Oh, His tenderness of heart. His humanity. Lord, that's what we need. Our heart cries out for His goodness. May we run to Him joyfully and and gladly. And may we never, ever turn our back on Him as you empower us by your Holy Spirit. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.